Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Day Dream Nation, and I've got Peter Jones back to the channel. How are you, my friend? Hello, Mr. Kerr, and an honor to be here again, sir. Fantastic. It, this is a continuation of our series, The Deep Purple Family Tree. We've got a corker of an episode. We are going to rank the top five Deep Purple Family live albums. Not Deep Purple, The Family. So it could be Whitesnake, it could be Rainbow, it could be Hughes Frawl, it could be Gillen. Anything that's had a connection with Deep Purple, top five live albums. Now, Pete, I didn't get a wink of sleep last night because I'm staring <laughs> at the ceiling and thinking, where am I going to rank this album or that album? How did you go with this one? It's pretty tough. I had some that clearly instantly stood out and... Then it became a fun experiment of uh, not so much deep diving, because a lot of these don't leave my consciousness too far, um, but it's trying to shuffle them around and go, oh, oh, wait, oh, oh, I forgot that one and, and that kind of thing. So, And I'm sure once it's over, I'll even go, oh, I forgot this. And if you bring one up or I bring one up, one over the other, or both of us may go, oh, I forgot yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's get to work. So top five. So I'll throw it over to you, Pete. What's your number five live Deep Purple Family album? All right. I'm going to do maybe something a little bit unusual here, Peter. So I'm, this is, I'm just going to do this. Um, I'm going not include this. This is my favorite album of all time. So I am not going to include Made in Japan. It's just there to the court default it will this will always be my favorite so i want to focus on some other records so we will not talk about made in japan today but it's just my favorite album of all time so let's go to my first pick and this one has been a real grower for me and it's just getting better and better and better and if we, we did this Further down the road, it might even be higher up on my list. I'm going with Glenn Hughes from Burning Japan Live. Now, some of you, if you're not familiar with this, this is from 1994. Um, Glenn is vocals only on this. He does not play bass. Um, his backing band is exceptional. It's got basically the rhythm section with keyboards from the band Europe. And they are stunning players, as well as Thomas Larson and Eric Bjornfeldt um, on guitars. Holy smokes, is this a powerhouse. It's got songs ranging from all over the place. Um, he had released a solo album called From Now On. There are, in 94, there are four tracks from there, one from Burn, four from Come Taste the Band, two from Stormbringer, one debut song, and three from the Hughes Thrall era. And holy smokes, the recording on this is massive. And his voice is enormous, so clean, so powerful, and the band is just spot on. Recorded at a smaller club, 1300 capacity in Kawasaki, Japan. Um, if you are not familiar with this one, man, you got some homework to do right off the shot because this is stunning, stunning stuff. And like I said, it's it's been the one that I just keep revisiting. So it, it's actually going to maybe go up my list in the future. But that's, that's a great album. Well, man, that's a sensational start. And I've got to say, Pete, I love Glenn Hughes. Um, and I I've seen him once. He came to Australia. He's come a few times, but for whatever reason, I haven't seen the other times. But the one time I did see him, he played a pub, had a pickup band, and he was on fire. And the first track he played live was Muscle. And yes. Life. Yeah. Oh, the shivers. The version, on, the version on here is just stunning. Just shivers went up my spine. Yeah. He was playing all these hues and frawl. And vocally, for his age, yeah. he is better than any vocalist out there. Yes. Perfect pitch. Um, and he just basically went to the audience and he says, I don't know how I do it, 
but I just do it. I just do it. And his bass playing, you know, I've read stories. Richie Blackmore did an interview and said, he's phenomenally talented. He doesn't practice. Man. He's just one of those guys that turns up and he just does it. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a great set list, great singing. Everything's amazing on this. Yeah. And it's just a great track. Um, All right. Well, my number five, I'm going a bit more traditional. This was a um, legitimate release. This was Rainbow on Stage. So Excellent. I'm going from, I think this came out in 1977. So came out very early in the piece in Rainbow, straight after Rainbow Rising. My opinion, this is the greatest lineup. So you're talking Blackmore, you're talking Tony Carey on keyboards, you're talking Jimmy Bain bass, you're talking about the great Cozy Powell. Um, it's just a magnificent album. The only probably criticism I have, it's it's short. It is truncated and taken from select uh, Japanese shows. There are actual releases that you can hear the whole um individual shows uh, that were recorded in Japan. But I love their vo- um, versions of songs. Like Kill the King, it's absolutely ferocious. I'm using your words, ferocious, <laughs> direct, right. astounding. It's all these Very adjectives good. I'll just throw. I-, I just love it. Man on the Silver Mountain. I've always had an issue with the studio version on the Richie Blackmore's Rainbow album, the first album, where it's a little bit sedate, you know. Dun, 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 dun. I love it where it just comes out of the gates. It's a little bit more sped up, you know. I like it, a little bit more punchy. Um, Catch the Rainbow and Mistreated, which I know you like, um, with Ronnie James Dio doing the um, the vocals. I think it's a great album, a document, a summary document of what that that lineup, the legendary Rainbow Rising lineup was, um, I think it's mighty fine. So there you go. Rainbow on stage. Great cover too. Absolutely. Stared at that for hours and hours and hours and the inner sleeve and the information on the back and how much gear they had and what oh, gear yeah. they were using. Yeah. I love that. I love that shot of um, Jimmy Bain. Look at him. That's He's one just- of his best shots ever. Yep. And, um, you know, he was a great, his bass playing, it, he is just outerworldly. He's really just pulsing the whole bottom end. He worked beautifully with Cozy, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He really did. That's a stunning album. Great choice. All right. All right. Well, number four, this one was one of the ones that was easy for me. Um, this one is so essential. Live in the Heart of the City, White Snake, and please, folks, do not get the truncated version. Get the full on with all with both the eighty show and the Hammersmith seventy eight. You got to get everything. Make sure you get it. This is my White Snake. This is the era that I love. This is their prime. This is from their nineteen eighty tour, and this is the Coverdale, Marsden, Moody, Lord, Pace, and Murray. Man, that is a band. And Coverdale's in spectacular form. The material on here is exceptional. Uh, Ian Pace still has throwbacks to his Purple Days. He's busy as heck. But Neil Murray is one of the real stars here. This guy is just foundationally perfect. His bass playing on Fool for Your Lovin'. Listen to what he's doing there. It's oh, just so great and i just couldn't stand that they recover that they did a redo of that on slip of the tongue i was just like no this one this is the version that you love i love that the 78 show is in there uh it's the david doyle era uh ian pace is not on that one but it's a it's a great uh snapshot of that era and there's some purple stuff in there um might just take your life is in there and uh, so it's it's a great collection, kind of a greatest hits, uh, barring a couple songs for us deeper fans. But this is the perfect overview of that era. They were phenomenal live. So there's no fall off or anything compared to the studio. In fact, I think these in most cases are the definitive versions for me. 
of most of these songs, especially Full for Your Lovin', Ready and Willin', Take Me With You, Sweet Talker, Come On, Walking in the Shadow of the Blues, spectacular. Some of the great, great fills from Mr. Pacey in that one. There's some licks that I borrowed and kept in my toolbox for the rest of my life. But super recording, sounds phenomenal, and it's just a great, great record. And I enjoy that one a lot. Well, could be more about that, um, more later, that later in this episode. But um, I want to ask you a question. What do you think of yeah. uh, David Duck Doyle's um, drumming? He's got a bit of a little feet feel about him, hasn't he? he well, he's clearly not as busy uh, mm. as, as Ian was. Um, but, you know, he's a good pocket player. And that was the thing back then. You know, all the guys like the Simon Kirks and, and players like that who were just perfect for what the music needed didn't overplay mm-hmm. um you know and i would even suggest that you know even uh you know gruber when he was with elf uh and then the first one i guess just kind of do what you need to do foundational strong was he in an upgrade yeah yeah he was and they took advantage of that musically especially live but it, those early albums with him, I have no complaints whatsoever because, first of all, you had nothing to compare it to. So you weren't going, gee, I wish they had Ian because Ian was never even a thought. So, yeah, I, I've always enjoyed everything that, that that era of White Snake and even before has done. It's all good stuff. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, my next uh, pick, and I'll put it up on the screen, is the album Live in Munich, 1977. So this was the long live rock and roll era where you have, oh, there you go. Bob, thank you. Bob Daisley is <laughs> on the uh, the bass and you've got David Stone on keyboards. This lineup was a band of possibilities. I would have loved for them to continue on, but it just wasn't meant to be because there was a change in direction. Right. Bob Daisley on bass is great. I even like his singing on um, Catch the Rainbow. He's a great foil for um, Cozy Powell and the bottom end. Richie's playing is absolutely ferocious. And when you know the backstory that Richie yes. was um, in jail, he kicked a very overzealous security person in another theatre in Germany. They locked him up. They were somehow able to get him out of jail. And he turned up to the performance in the same concert garb that he you know was wearing two in. days earlier <laughs> yep. at 11 o'clock and put in a performance which you, you know i mean if you're in jail for a day or two you'd be absolutely knackered you'd be exhausted he comes out firing and yes. i i get this feel about richie um you know pete that when he's there's adversity and he's angry it comes out and he's playing and right. it comes out in spades. I think this is a, a fine performance. It's a very much a 70s concert because 70s live compared to 80s and 90s was very much on solos. It, I think it's probably a throwback to where, you know, the jazz era where everyone does a lot of improvisation. Like, you know, when you look at the concert in um, the California Jam. How long does Highway Star? Um, no, Space Trucking, that goes for like 20, right. 24 minutes. So, right, sure. there's, yeah, there's a lot of that sort of uh, long soloing, but it's never boring. It's compelling. They're all firing on all cylinders. I just I, I just get a little bit sad because I think this was a an outfit of possibilities. I would have loved to have seen this band because they had a bit of a chemistry to just do um, to do more. And when I interviewed Bob Daisley, he said the same thing. It was kind of one of those greater, greatest career what ifs, but it wasn't meant to be. But um, look, Kill the King, Mistreated, uh, 16th Century Greensleeves, Catch the Rainbow, all the the essential rainbow early um, era songs are there. It's, it's top notch. I really recommend get the video, listen to the album. um, And it's in my top five live in Munich, 1977. Absolutely. And I'm just going to kind of dovetail on it and then I'll replace it with something else because it's in my top five. And as much as I absolutely love on stage, when I heard this, this was kind of the 
one that kind of took it over and became the superior of, of those kind of tracks. They're more, the band is more rested. They'd had a couple of days off as well. Ronnie's voice is stronger. I think it's the band was tighter than those late 76 Japanese shows. Um, his version of mistreated on here is epic. It's one of my top five favorite Dio performances of all time. Cozy's on fire. They add the drum solo back. They have all of the vocalizations that were kind of edited out. Uh, during Man on the Silver Mountain, when Ronnie does his Night People segment, it's just stunning. It's stunning. And it's, it's just one of those things. And it's, that's just, and they were, and Richie was, like you said, just a man on a mission. Um, so I'm going to go with number three here. And while listed as an official, I'm going with Deep Purple, Live in Paris, 1975. These uh, overseas live things that are coming out are really great. And the reason I like this one um, versus some of the other ones that I may look at here, this is recorded April 7th, uh, 1975, Paris, France. This is during the Stormbringer era. Uh, so similar set list to what you know, most people would know is made in Europe, that kind of thing. Uh, what I do love in it is that Gypsy is included here, which I absolutely love. Um, they even add a version of Going Down on here that I love. Um, but the recording is absolutely spectacular. The band is on full force. Um, Richie and Ian and John are just three guys who are just basically sword fighting the entire show. It's thrust and parry, thrust and parry. You, no, nope, you go, I go, wait a second. That was great. Watch this. I know I topped you here. Just the s stuff that just makes Deep Purple my favorite band of all time. Vocals are astonishing. Both David and Glenn here are really, really good. And it's a long it's a long two disc, so it's a long show, and I just love it. And this is the era. And you know, look, Mark III, for as few of studio records they did, were a very prolific live <laughs> band. And there was a lot of recordings of Mark III, and this is one of the best. So Paris 75, and I love that one. Well, funny you should say that because in 1975, I chose Mark III as well, but I did their Rats show, which is yes. in the same um, pool as the Made in Europe. Yep. This is the best Mark III album I've heard. I love it. Um, so one of the big complaints about Mark III is where Glenn Hughes may have gone too far, pushed it, and there was a competition between him and David. David's a very masculine, um, Paul Rogers, that lower um, tone. And then you've got the, um, the tonality of, of Hughes where he's very Glenn, um, you know, he's doing the Stevie Wonder, the very soul, the R&B thing. Right. And, you know, kind of for me on the California Jam, it mars it a little bit where he pushes it too much, whether it may be that. A little too scatty. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that. You know, it's sort of kind of dominated David, you know, when they were doing their sort of vocal uh, trade-offs. But this album, it's in control and mm -hmm. the playing is ferocious. Now, I think there's another element to this because Richie had resigned. He's gone. He was mm -hmm. going into Rainbow. He was checking out. But I notice in Richie's career, when he knows that it's finishing up, he puts in really ferocious shows like the battle rages on that tour, the later part of the battle rages on, which we did another show, check it out, folks. The last couple of shows that he did, he played with a lot of ferocity. So I think if Richie knows that this is it, you know, this is my final statement, he comes out guns firing. And I think on that Europe tour, which is, you know, you can even hear it in made in Europe. He plays with ferocity that those earlier tours he may not have quite had at that level. Right. This only has five songs. So Burn, Mistreated, Lady Double Dealer, You Fool No One and Stormbringer. 
brilliant playing, beautiful. Um, the version of Mistreated, you can understand why they picked David Coverdale, the tonality. Mm -hmm. For me, David Coverdale is the guy who sings Mistreated. He sings it with, with passion, with gravitas. And, you know, he was only quite young, um, but he you close your eyes and you listen to it and it sounds like somebody that's world weary and gone through the ringers. It's just pure blues. It's just wonderful. But um, Pete, between your album that you put up just before and, and Gratz, I just think folks, you couldn't go wrong with either. I think it's Mark three at their, um, their finest. And to be quite frank, a lot of the live stuff from Mark three, the earlier part of Mark three was a bit hit and miss where the band were trying to find the right dynamics. And maybe Glenn Hughes was just showboating and pushing it a little too much, but right. it's really balanced here. Great. Um, it's a great, great, um, great choice. Now, you just mentioned, so I'll just segue right into it. I'm going to go to that little earlier era. So this is live in London. And again, you want to make sure you get the whole version. You know, this was recorded in May of, of 74. And this is before uh, Stormbringer. So there is nothing on there. So this has got lay down, stay down, and might just take your life which makes this one you different than the ones that came later because those were dropped. And this one seems more controlled. It's not as crazy hectic as the ones we just showed, the later ones that seem to just have kind of a raw, aggressive, unhinged, just assault. This seems more rehearsed. Now, that's not a bad thing, folks. I mean, it's, it's spectacular and there's improvisation all through it, but it's a little more contained, a little tighter. And I love how that sounds and I love the versions and I think everybody is totally on top of their game. Of course, I think that's redundant because I never heard them off it. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, but it's, it's just one of those great recordings. Martin Birch really nailed it. It's got incredible sonics uh and it's also got one of my absolute favorite ian pace drum solos in you fool no one and it's hard to rival you know my made in japan but this one comes pretty close um and it just sounds amazing and i i like having the delineation between the burn tour and and stormbringer and this is one of the the real go-to's for the burn tour so that's why i picked that one Great, great stuff there, Pete. Um, I'll throw you a question. What do you think of the California Jam? You know, festivals like that are really hard to do. Everybody's kind of coming and going. You're not getting your sound checks. You know, mm. you've kind of got your backline gear, but they're not really your techs. The sound guys aren't your guys. I mean, there's just a lot. You kind of come in, plug and play. Uh, Richie clearly had some edge to him that is yes. <laughs> and from that standpoint the instrumental part of the show i thought was vicious they were ian pace was just man on a mission watch yes. the section where he comes up into the first solo on you fool no one and it highlights he's just thunder thundering mm. away yeah and hughes's bass worked great and they were busier during this period um, because there was a little more space to move things around and Lord was firing, but Richie's tone through this whole burn Stormbringer era is just one of the gl most glorious things I've ever heard. It's got so much bite to it. It just yes. is like a laser. And, you know, again, he had hijinks in, in, in order because he, had his roadie fill the back of that cabinet with patrol and kaboom. And you see the move where he kind of arches his back. That's not fake, folks. The blast almost blew him off the front of the stage. Would have killed Ian Pace. Pace is, <laughs> well, it Pace knocked is, his glasses off. Pacey's glasses came off. I mean, occupational health and safety, folks, in 2024. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, and then he and the cameraman were not having uh, a good night. And he warned the guy, he's like, don't get too close. And of course, 
Richie had to mm. start, which yeah. they got fined for, of course. Um, but, you know, it's a great set. Um, I think Coverdale sounds uh, not as good as he would later sound. Um, Glenn's voice is always strong. I do think that Glenn, as you mentioned before, was maybe a bit more dominant. It's showboaty. A little bit. Yeah. Lady. You know, yeah. when he gets the wah-wah pedal and he does the woo, woo, mm. where he's getting the crowd going and, um, you know, and then Dave's just kind of standing there with his mic stand. Yeah. <laughs> not, really, not really doing much, but instrumentally, like I said, they were as good as they've ever been. And I, I enjoyed from that standpoint. And I do like all the crazy hijinks and, and I mean, yeah, look, he drags the cabinets over and he's just not pretending. He's just like over the edge. <laughs> yeah. Go. You know, and he keeps trying guitars and he plugs it in for five seconds. Nah, take that one off. Bash yeah. it. Play it with his foot. He was out of his mind. And I'm glad that they really pushed the point to make sure that the band is on at sunset because there was yeah. a bit of argy bargy with the promoter that they wanted come out them of the to come on room. much earlier. Yeah. Yeah. He, he wouldn't come out. Yeah. That's Blackies. Yeah, right? because if you go to a festival, folk, uh, folks, when you sunset is the most effective time in a festival for a band to come out. Um, right. You don't want to play at midday. You don't want to play in the bright sun. So I think Richie, he had the smarts of, yeah, you know, marketing and promoting himself and the band. At, yeah. So, all right. Well, this is a little segue. Pete, you said you weren't going to talk about it, so I'll talk about it, but right. I will invite commentary. Um, sure. You've got to put Made in Japan. It's in everyone. I mean, they do polls, NME magazine, Rolling Stone magazine, all the magazines uh, over the last 50 years that do the great, greatest live albums of all time. It's right up there, you know, and it's marked to at its finest. This yes. wasn't going to be an official release. There was a bit of a demand from Japan, and then it, it, you know, became an album. It went number seven in the US, I think, not top ten in um, UK. It's one of their biggest selling albums. It put Deep Purple right to one of the biggest selling acts in the the seventies. They were on fire, and yes. um, just the performances. It, it's actually uh, it picks. You know, I think they did about three or four performances in Japan. Well, they, they did I three. I that album, yes. Yep. And, you know, sorry to interrupt. Um, you know, this is the one now that is kind of my go-to because, and if people talk about live albums, and we won't get in the weeds here, but it's the always how live is it live? Well, let's just make this very clear, folks. There's not one single overdub in this record. In all three of these shows, not one. Yeah, And this is exactly how they were on stage at that time in August of 1972. And you're like, oh, that's not true. Well, it is true. Because if you go and listen to this, this is all three nights in their entirety. And the reason the version of Smoke on the Water is on Made in Japan is because the other two nights, Richie screwed up the intros. Played them mm. wrong. Yeah. One night he played the wrong chord. Another, he hits an open note that just an open string, and you can hear Gillen in the back go, <laughs> yeah. he's laughing. So, yeah. yeah, it's live. Every mistake, every everything is on this. Yeah. And it is just a band at maybe the highest peak any band that I know could have been. They're at the peak of their powers. I don't think I've heard Ian Gillen sing better. That and he was folks. not well. Either. Yep. Yep. He was under the weather. Yep. So his his voice conquered hard rock, um, and this is the you know this is proof in the pudding. Pete, I'm not a big fan of drum solos, so I have to admit when I do play this, when it gets to the pacey drum solo, I know you probably listen to it and just love it, a but billion it's times. a little long for me. That's the only quibble I've ever had with this album. Are drum solos, even for you, being an affectionado of drums, a little bit too long? They can be. Certainly, mm. if they start to, you know, rely on... I, I look at it this way. There is a strong delineation between seeing it and hearing it. 
if you see it, a lot of times later on, the drum solos will be uh, in tandem with some type of visual stage effect or some kind of thing at where that can hold your attention and take, you know, not focus on, well, how long has he been going? A solo like this, which is just strictly a solo's purpose, and especially when you replay it back auditorily only on an album, it has to be entertaining all the way through. It has to create peaks and valleys. And the beauty I love and the thing that I've always loved the most about Pacey is that this type of solo is not unlike what you would have heard from Buddy Rich or from Joe Murillo or Louis Belson or any of these other great jazz players not too long before Purple started mm. playing. That's where he got it from. He's got all of the things and the elements you start out flashy, you go down to a snare roll, you bring in a bass drum only, you start a motif, you move the, and that's, it's classic jazz, big band drumming formula 101. Mm. And it became the staple for the rock drum solo. And yeah. some did it a lot better than others. Um, but he's, cause he's, that's his DNA. And yep. that's, that's why I love it so much. Yeah, yeah. It also created the subgenre of bands uh, recording in Japan. How many made in Japan, live in Japan? I mean, this this really right. kick started it off that Japan was the market. I love the audience; they're very polite, aren't they? It's just very, <laughs> very polite and courteous. I, I, I love at the end of Space Trucking. It's almost like they're shell shocked. You hear just the last of the. Yeah. And there's <laughs> like, can we breathe now? You know, and you're just like, what just hit us? Mm. <laughs> it's just, that would have been amazing. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, yeah, I just think it's one of the great, greatest live albums of all time. And um, it really deserves um, all the accolades, its reputation. Um but yeah, Ian Gillen, if you want to hear him at his absolute stone cold peak, this is the album. And a lot of the versions of these songs, like Strange Kind of Woman. I've spoken about this before. Deep Purple have groove. They are not four on the floor. They actually swing. Yes, swing. And That's this song swings. I love it. And, you know, I love the little interplay. You know, they kind of sort of created that. You know, Blackmore does a little riff. Gillen sings it back. The trade-off, right. I love it. As you called yeah. it, sword fighting. Yeah, a little on-stage parlay, yeah. Parry and thrust. Yeah. Right. All righty. So we're at the business end. What well, I'm going to put pick? this in. Yeah, because uh, I'm going to move this one. And, and you know, other than Made in Japan, which will always be my one, the others are kind of all just 1A, one 1Bs. One so I have to mention this. I think this is absolutely astonishing. This is where everything comes into focus for Mark II. And you say, well, how did it, you know, well, here's the deal. John Lord, the classical master that he is, wanted to write and was always writing classical compositions and wanted to write the concerto. And they now have... Gillen, and they now have Roger Glover. And those early shows, if you can listen to early 70s, very early 70s stuff, and you know, where they're playing Ring the Neck and stuff like that, that Gillen and Glover contribute to. Oh, crazy fierce. And those are great. So the band agreed that they would do this. Richie says, if this is huge. I'll play in orchestras the rest of my life. He said, but if not, I want to go down the hard rock road. Well, not that I wish something to not be successful. <laughs> Good. <laughs> because we didn't, we wouldn't have gotten in rock. If this would have been like some super monster masterpiece, you know, Richie would still be on his red 335 playing things that John told him to play. Well, that's not what happened. And the beauty of this is if you get the full version, most have only heard the concerto part of it, which I think is outstanding. But if you get the full show that night, they play a version of Hush, 
wring that neck and child in time before the uh, concerto is played. So yes. it's kind of like you get them because there was uh, Malcolm Arnold had composed uh, the symphony number no. six, which they played first. Purple without the orchestra played their songs. Then they came together and played the concerto on the way out. And I think that is wildly fascinating. I think it just highlights the not, there's not a big separation folks, as we think between classical music and hard rock and metal. There are elements that tie them together forever. Look, we can go on and do a whole separate show about how a lot of the classical pieces, the big ones were the heavy metal of the day. And they inspired and felt and, and gave off the same kind of feelings we get when we hear a loud guitar. When Wagner's got a whole stage and full of trumpets and timpani players and the venue you're in is shaking, you have the same reaction. It's volume, it's intensity, it's power. Just different notes in different order. But this is a really spectacular piece and I love it from a classical side. I love it for the rock side. And I think the interplay between the band is really, really great and it's really well done. And I think this is oft overlooked. Um, no, you're not going to rank this with Machine Head and all this. It's its its, its own thing, but it's a great own thing. And I wanted to make sure we highlighted that one today. Well, you, you certainly surprised me. And I, that's why I love doing these shows. Um, firstly, just a few things to unpack. It's really strange that Richie said, well, if this is a success, we'll just do orchestras. He, he sounded like he wasn't really totally invested and considering that he turned into Ludwig van Beethoven on the Renaissance, uh, I find that quite, quite humorous. You know? um, some classical albums where they do a merging with metal just do not work. No. I'm talking to you, Metallica, S&M, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's where awesome. it just jars. The arrangements, are, are they there to embellish the hook lines? the riffs or well, are they they're done there? after the fact or are they there to provide a counterpoint? Yeah. They're, they're done after those songs have already been created. This was created with them as an integral mm. part, how they went back and forth. So this wasn't yep. something separate. Yeah. So yep. the integration was part of the composition itself, which I think is always the better way to go. Yeah. But it takes way more work. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't think the band really grooved on it other than John Lord until in 1999 or 2000 where I think somebody transcribed the score yes, the and they were able to I do it again. Had been lost. Yeah. Yep. And then I think the band were totally invested and thought, this is genius. Yes. So when they, they did right. the Royal Albert Hall and they brought in special guests like Ronnie James Dio Ronnie. and yep. yeah. That's where I think the band, it took them a long time to really realize this is a great work of art. This is a mm -hmm. fantastic um, piece. But in the day, it got reviled. Um, a lot of people didn't, didn't like that. And I, it, I don't know if this is just a, a misconception, but that was the album that had to happen for In Rock to occur. I don't right. know. No. And look, and still to this day, there are still more than a plenty highbrow classical people who will yeah. at, you know, pop and rock musicians as they are viewed in some cases as somehow less than, um, you know, that exists. And I, I, I saw it myself. Um, but back then, I'd have to think that it was probably even more segregated that they're like, you want us to what? <laughs> yeah, we're playing what? And I'm sure these orchestras had never remotely encountered the kind of volume and intensity that the guys in purple were bringing yeah. at that time, even if subdued for the orchestral portion of it. Uh, that's just something they just were never used to or accustomed to. Monitoring was horrible back then. Who knows if they could even hear mm. what they were doing. Uh, so it had to be really challenging and really difficult. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the version of Child in Time absolutely smokes. And um, yeah. it was before the performance, Ian goes, shit, there's no lyrics. 
So he was in a cafe outside the Royal Albert Hall or something, and he literally wrote the lyric on a napkin. Well, yeah, in his little interlude where he sings, John kept asking him, you got it? Yeah, mate, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, what shall I do? I mean, these are not very thought-provoking, you know, but he just, he sings them so convincingly because he's that good of an orator that you're just like, oh, okay. And his voice is so rich and so unbridled and powerful. You can just tell when he just pushes just a little with his volume. It's like the whole Albert Hall just reverberates. And you're like, that's cool stuff. Yeah. yeah. And that napkin, I believe, was on his either at a music stand or something down in front of him. or But he's just, yeah. But he's like, if I believe it, you'll believe it. Absolutely. And that's how he delivered it. And Absolutely. that's great. That's a great musician right there. Yeah, he's one of the most interesting. I, I never get sick of reading stories about Ian. He's the most uh, fascinating right. um, vocalist in rock. Cool. Oh. And yours, sir? Well, not surprising, Pete. What's left? <laughs> the there it the is. The <laughs> and it is the double, um, the double album. So live in Hammersmith, 1978, as well as live in the heart of the city, 1980. Originally, the Hammersmith, 1978, was just a Japan only. Yes. Um, so yeah. they combine both of them. But going to the 1978 show, to me, and this may be heresy, um, mistreated, that's my favourite version of the song ever. I just It's a great version. Bernie Marsden, it's just emotional. Now, these guys, Moody and Marsden aren't as flashy as Blackmore, but the tonality, the emotion, you can they're squeezing all the emotion projecting it. It's just wonderful. And I just think Coverdale's vocals, you just feel every drip of emotion through this, his vocals. It's just mm -hmm. wonderful. Uh, come on, might just take your life. He's injecting these old purple songs, the, the new material. It works wonderfully. The 1980 show, you can see that they've got some sea legs. They're even more assured. Um, yes. it's a little bit heavier, but I love it. I mean, walking in the shadow of the blues. Now, folks say that David Coverdale can't write a good lyric. He can when he puts his mind to it. And that is a yes. great lyric. It's simple. It's heartfelt. It's direct. That's probably one of David Coverdale's greatest lyrics. Fool for your loving, classic song, um, ready and willing. I just think it's a wonderful show. And they always talk about the Hammersmith Choir. And I think they had a connection with their audience. And that's why a lot of people felt betrayed in 1987. Mm -hmm. I talk, I, I talked to a lot of folks on YouTube, um, you know, older Whitesnake fans, and they felt like it was like a knife in the heart when they changed into that, um, that kind of that hair metal in 1987. I don't care for it. Because they remember the emotional connection of going to those shows. And right. they said, Peter, you will never understand unless you were there. The connection between the band and especially Coverdale and the audience, mm -hmm. it was like a church. It was like a community. He would be singing directly to us. It was like an emotional experience. Yeah. So night and day. And I think this album sort of really does pick up about the, the emotional velocity of these songs because a lot of those earlier albums, I love the material, but the production is like um, somebody just Little compromised. It. Yep. Martin Birch was having a cup of tea and just going, oh, David, just do what you have to do. It's only until bit, right? maybe ready and willing and come and get it that there's a little bit more um, attention play, mm -hmm. paid to the Sonics, but Trouble and Love Hunter, um, yeah, the production is a little bit whiffy, but live it's where it's at and you can really hear this is where the songs breathe. And they've got that velocity and they've got that emotional gravitas. So Well, and way before Here I Go Again and stuff like that, Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City was the song for me. That was yeah, that was the sing-along. That was the emotional one. It's just the harmonies are amazing. Mm. You know, you just get the crowd going. And, of course, I'll, I'll do a G version. Come on, let me effing hear ya. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they're all singing away. And I'm like... 
this is this is great. And it's interesting to me, Pete, because a lot of times when a singer leaves the band and starts his own band, a lot of times they take the same instrumentation along with them. And Coverdale decided to go with two guitars. And he always had two guitars, which was not a purple thing, obviously. And I found that to be an interesting choice, that he wanted to have that extra palette and the way that they interplayed with each other and, you know, all the times that they played, you know, um, Marsden and Moody were almost like of the same mind. They played so well together. Mm. No competition. It's just all for the good of the song. And I think that's a really interesting uh, observation that he decided to go with. The, he keeps, the, obviously he keeps the keyboard. He wants that. Um, and later, later, that keyboard starts to get phased out and the guitars now start to really, really take over. And the keys are only kind of there for color or an intro or, or that kind of thing, um, which was an evolution. But I, I love what he did during this period. And that album just showcases it in spades. It's just beautiful. Absolutely. Well, he, he had a vision for the band similar to the Allman Brothers. Mm. Secondly, the guitarist that he picked, he said, look, I had played with a couple of guitar heroes and I've got stung, Blackmore, Bolan. And you, we know mm. how that, those two uh, adventures ended. He wanted to go with two guitarists that were sturdy, solid, but not too showy in the sense of being the right. guitar hero. But right. in, it's ironic in a way. I've always thought Bernie Marsden was a bit of a guitar hero for me because um, his passing last year really affected me because I think he was one of the finest blues guitarists that the UK had produced, the tonality, even B.B. King said that guy he's got game i mean well in a gentle soul from absolutely. every interview just absolutely everybody wanted to kind of talk to uncle bernie yeah, yeah that's what he felt like yeah yeah read his yeah. book folks it's it's a great read about the um sort of the 70s uh british music and um his adventures but um oh i just think the synergy of this band this is the classic lineup and i love what you were saying about neil murray subtle bass yeah very subtle he's one of those remarkable musicians that had to change his bass style to go into 1987 there's not too many this is probably a topic for another show but somebody that has had to change their whole style to suit a, a different style of music that shows that he is a master of the bass but just his subtle bass lines just wonderful well, when um, he came in, when he came into tour on Headless Cross, and then with the, that stabilized, even with Cozy there, having that bass player there was like having another geezer, someone who was just so foundational, perfect for the song, could play busy, could play simple, whatever he needed, and he was there, a hundred percent predictable, reliable, professional, and I just think he's stunning. Yeah, I yeah. love that guy, bass player. Yeah, so. absolutely. Honorables, can I fire those yes, off? Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Throw a couple All of right. honorables. Let me just do this real quick. This one may seem really strange. So part of the family, part of the tree. I am pulling up this. Malmsteen's Trial by Fire, live in Leningrad. This is recorded uh, in, in 1989. This is from uh, the one album with Joe Lynn Turner. And, of course, my first thing was, what in God's name is this going to sound like? I thought these are just two points of a compass that are always going the wrong direction. And I will admit that I found the studio album very compelling. Um, and there were tracks on there that I thought was some of the best stuff that Momstein had done. And there are some flaws with this. Sorry, I keep doing it crooked. It's a horrible recording. One of the worst productions of an official live record I've ever heard. It is so muddy. The Johansson brothers are, are a mess and his vocals are very recessed, but there was something about having Jolene in there doing the songs from even the three previous records that worked for me. He was a more pop style singer. He was a more melodic singer and Baumstein was playing his butt off. And the highlight of this is 
the live version of Spanish Castle Magic by Jimi Hendrix. I will say categorically, go ahead and fire at me if you want, is the, my favorite Malmsteen solo of his entire career. Because he's not playing as much like him. He's just stepped aside, played blues. He's got tons of great Hendrix licks. He leaves space. He holds a, a distorted feedback note for what seems like forever. And you're like, yes, yes, space, phrasing. And he can still fire his licks off. And it then became more impressive. I'm like, are you paying attention here, Ingve? This is what you should have been doing all along. So we all don't have listener fatigue. So there's that one. And this one I had to throw in because this is really interesting. The Boys Club, live from California. Keith Emerson, Glenn Hughes, and Mark Bonilla. This was done in 1998, and this is a very deep, most people have no clue what this was. It was a show that was recorded. It's got all kinds of tracks in it. It's got a version of Hoedown. It's got Glenn Hughes sings a version of Whiter Shade of Pale. It's awesome. He does Tarkus. What does Glenn Hughes sound like doing Tarkus? It's here. And there's, they do a version of Nut Rocker. And so it's a combination. And those who don't know uh, Mark Bonilla, that guy's been on everything. He was on CTA, which was Danny Serafin's version of Chicago, California Transit Authority. Uh, I believe he's maybe even currently he's the lead guy in Asia. I don't know if he's, if he's uh, doing that. He's done a ton of films. He's done a ton of uh, soundtrack stuff. Great, great player. But it is simply for the uniqueness of it, the collaboration that you would never expect. And you look at it on paper and you go, but check it out. There's some really cool moments in here. Some don't work, but that's okay. It's a good, it's a good learning experience. It's a good listening experience experiment and it's a good exercise to hear three really great musicians and their backing supporters so i i need to get that I, i've i've seen it but i've never um listened to it so i will definitely um seek that one out pete um thank you for that um a couple of honorable mentions come hell or high water which is the end of richie's tenure in the mark ii so we as i said we did a show on the battle rages on and Live, I don't have a. I think he plays with such ferocity and directness, and I think he knows in his head he's checking out. He's going onto new pastures, but he plays with a lot of fire in the belly, and um, I think it's much, much better than the album. My personal opinion. So that's definitely worth checking out. Um, the Castle Donington Rainbow, nineteen eighty, which was mm -hmm. the um, final performance of Cozy Powell. You've got Graham Bonnet. Um, that's a wonderful document of that particular time. Um, that's definitely worth uh, checking out. Um, I notice I try to, in my heart of hearts, to to put a Gillen um, band in the live albums, but I've got to be fair, none of their live albums were, they're kind of patchy, um, either the sonically, one, the way it was yes. mixed. Yeah. They're kind the of Buddha even more, one. yeah, they're, they're kind of shambolic, a little bit punky, but there's a lot to recommend. I'm sure, I just hope, heart of hearts, that somebody's got a tape somewhere and it'll come out and somebody will mix it and it'll come out as the definitive of Gillen band live because they are a mighty fine band and they need to be documented. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of shortage of material on that one, Pete. Well, uh, the early the early stuff too, real fast, um, uh, Live at the Olympia uh, with Steve Morris with Purple is a very, very strong live record. That's heavy. Yeah. And it's very early on, so there's a lot of stuff from Perpendicular, obviously. Um, and then the uh, Australian tour, Total Abandon, yes, is is also a stellar, stellar Morris era. So both of those are highly recommended as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there you go, folks. Um, so I'm going to put Peter on the spot, and this is probably a surprise to him. But our next show is we're going to be ranking the top ten Deep Purple Family studio albums. Oh. 
All right. So top ten. Top ten. Okay. Okay. That's going to be humongous. So any, um, it's going to be studio albums in the Deep Purple family, our 10 favourite, and um, that's going to be a humongous show. So watch out for that uh, coming soon. But um, Pete Jones, thank you very much. This has been a wonderful show. Um, as I said, I was tossing and turning with the, the top five, but I think we agree the Deep Purple family were just wonderful. It's just a, such a broad palette of great live albums because um, mm -hmm. let's face it, their natural hunting ground was live. That's yeah, where right. it's at. So absolutely. Um, you can see Pete Jones on the Contrarians. Please type in the um, Pete Jones and the Contrarians. You'll see a lot of shows. Um, please tell us what your favorite Deep Purple live album is or Deep Purple family tree album we would love to read your comments but uh one thing's for sure me and pete will be talking more purple and more rock in 2024 on rock daydream nation check us out cheers